Okay, let's get started. I think we're, we're about ready now. We're going we're gonna to... You guys ready? We're going to talk a little bit about uh, transportation. To yeah, it's for recording, so... I, I can just let me know if I need to speak louder. That's, that's fine. Yeah, okay, sorry. <coughs> been finding a cold lately. Um, many of you know Rob. Um, Rob's going to talk a little in a little bit, but you don't know me. I'm, I'm Peter Kerr. Um, I work, uh, you can hit this slide there. Uh, I work in this building in um, South Sacramento. I work for the California Department of Food and Agriculture Plant Pest Diagnostics Branch. Um, that's uh, off of uh, Meadowview Road um, down in South Sacramento. Um, you can go ahead and click. Uh, and I, I do all s different kinds of work on uh, insects um, and descriptive taxonomy of fungus gnats is uh, particularly what I, I'm interested in um, for my research. Um, my, my wife and I, we moved to Davis uh, in 2003 and I'm now a, a happy father of three uh, growing up here in the Davis school system. Um, the one thing about uh, working in Sacramento and it, it bothered me that the uh, my personal carbon footprint was uh, a, a lot of it was taken up by the car if I had to drive um, and it was a round trip of about 52 miles um, and as a scientist I've, I, and a nature of lover I've always been concerned about the environment uh, and even more so once I became a parent so this um, this really bothered me so I, I, I uh, adjusted by um, riding my bike um, and that's it was tough it was uh, you know it's it's about my work is about 10 miles south of Sacramento so I um, I rode uh, it was about three hours a day um, and uh, so when I had the first when we had the first child Can I for just a second? we can't hear over there because you're so loud is there a way of talking just a little bit oh something? sure <laughs> I mean, uh, sure. <laughs> so, uh, all right. So I'll have to find a balance here. <laughs> um, so, uh, so I, uh, after our second child, I, I, it was just impossible to, to ride. Um, and so to, we, in 2011, got a, an electric car. Um, and uh, so nowadays, actually, you can... Um, we got a Nissan Leaf. Uh, nowadays, there are, oh, the variety of electric cars are amazing, and you see them every day in Davis. Um, some great deals on, on electric cars. And so when, um, when, you, when you say, I just go get an electric car, is it that easy? You must be, you must be wealthy. You must have a lot of money, or there, it must be... It's, you don't just go out and get a new car. So, um, so I, if you click on the next... This is the economics of my electrical, electric vehicle purchase in 2011. So I was using a, a 1996 Honda Accord driving to work, uh, stinky uh, four-door. Um, I sold it for $2,000. Um, the initial payment to take the new Nissan Leaf off the lot was $2,000. So I broke even on that. A month later, uh, there's a rebate program in California. I got a check for $5,000. Just a check in the mail, $5,000. So here I traded in this dirty old stinky car and I get a brand new Bluetooth navigation, everything else, quiet, rides like a monorail, and $5,000 in my pocket. And then uh, and the lease was for three years, $400 a month. So the first year was paid up front of this car. Not a hard decision at all. I mean, it was a very easy, nice thing. So in, after three years, my lease was up. Um, I took that, uh, I took my old one in and they said, uh, just here, take the keys and, and shop around when you do, if you're looking in the, uh, how many of you guys already drive electric cars? No? Okay. Um, if you are, there's, there are a lot of differences in price. I got mine in Petaluma because the people in Davis weren't all that receptive. They weren't all that helpful and it wasn't that cheap, but in Petaluma is great. People are really, so shop around that may have changed, but, um, so I took it back to Petaluma, <clears throat> changed my car for a better one, a newer one, and I got a, the rebate check now is no longer 5,000, it's 2,500. Still, I got $500 in my bank, in my pocket, 
a new car and the lease was half the price. So when you go for your car, it doesn't really, to me, make sense to buy because it's like buying an Apple, like an iPhone versus leasing an iPhone for a year. You know, you don't want to, you can, the next model is going to be better. It's going to be cheaper. It's going to last longer. It's going to have more features. So lease deal is amazing. So you go ahead. Um, in the vehicle itself, it's very, th it's naturally thrifty. There, there are no spark plugs, no engine, no, no uh, <clears throat> transmission fluid, single speed in the leaf, no oil change, no smog checks, no visits to the gasoline stations where you're smelling the fumes, you're taking time out of, out of your day. Um, so in your t you charge overnight at your own home, and the cost of it is, even compared to a Prius, is rock bottom. So the, the, the cost of running it is very cheap as well. You're saving all along the way. It's two cents a mile. Um, but what are you, uh, how are you using your car? So we, w w the electric cars now, the range isn't yet uh, extended to the degree you can use these all the time. But for most people, they drive 70 miles or less in a day. And the, the range for my Leaf is about 90 miles. So you're, you're covered. You don't need to, you just, over, you just plug in your car overnight like you do your cell phone. And... Uh, but we do have another vehicle, and this takes, oh, hold on a sec, uh, it, it, uh, it's about 20%, we have loads to carry, or, or we have longer trips to the mountains or the beach, we can always take the van, I love the van, you know, there's some things you, you so, um, and when you compare, but when you compare the uh, electric motor and the uh, internal combustion engine, there's really no comparison in terms of carbon footprint, you have, uh, the engine itself is much more efficient in transferring power to the wheels. Um, and even in the case where you have the worst source of electricity, it's a cleaner vehicle. <clears throat> uh, fortunately, in California, our electricity is quite clean. There's less than 1% or one, less than 1% of uh, our electricity comes from coal. We have a lot of hydroelectric, nuclear, geothermal, wind. Uh, biomass, um, a lot of, it's fairly clean electricity. So, um, and of course, as we set regulations and our electrical system modernizes, the cars that are now on the road drive cleaner and cleaner as, the year, as our electrical grid becomes cleaner. Whereas, if you're driving a gas car, the, the extraction and the, the terms of that gas that you get, it's becoming dirtier and dirtier with time. And what's amazing is the energy that goes into refining that gasoline. You use, it's about six kilowatt hours of electricity to, to refine that gasoline. On an electrical car, uh, electric car, even with a, the current day generation, you can drive 20, 25 miles on six kilowatt hours. So in fact, when you add into the oil distribution and the, uh, the additional oil extraction processes, EVs use less electricity than internal combustion engines uh, per mile driven. So it, it sort of boggles your mind, but it's such an inefficient, that gas system that you're, you're, you're buying into when you pay that um, gas bill at, you know, at the station. Um, and of course, the nice, especially nice thing about electric vehicles is that, well, is compared to gas vehicles, you can't make gas at home but you can make the power that drives your vehicle at home. And in fact, you can, it, it, we put solar panels in our house five months later after getting, I couldn't find any photos of that, but, um, and if you look at our, uh, the, uh, the carbon footprint pie, your, your emissions, your personal emissions, um, you've got a lot of it, you can't probably see this, but it's uh, home energy use is a big part of that pie. And transportation is the other big part of that pie. Well, if you get solar panels, and a lot of no, uh, electric car drivers get solar panels, you're taking both of that and making it zero as far as carbon goes. So it's a great synergy with what you already want to do in your, in your life. Um, and this below is that that's the uh, percentage of the U.S. expenditure, you know, of, of energy. Um, I find driving... <laughs> and I'm see, I, so all that sort of you thinking, I'm nice and pretty, I've got the, my finances set up. It's such a wonderful car. And if you know anyone who has an electric car, is forced to drive one. I mean, I, I prefer to bike. I have to have a car because of my work. I, I don't, and we bike, you know, exclusively when and we can. But 
Um, when I do get in the car, it's not rum, rum, rumbling, hot, vibrating, and, and it's inexpensive. But the biggest thing is you, you're, you're decoupled from that whole system of, uh, you know, uh, horizon spills in the Gulf, spills in the Yellowstone River, uh, oil trains crashing, destroying these wars and, and all of this nasty, nasty politics, the democracy of our system is, is held by this, these guys, this, this system. And when you drive an electric car, you're free of that. And the value of that in your own well-being and sort of ethical, moral compass is extremely gratifying. So I... I I don't see why more people aren't driving electric cars when they have to drive. If you're not, um, uh, you know, riding your bike, getting around, and some of us can. So that's that's what I was. That was my sort of prepared remark. And Rob will be talking too. So the question was, um, the trouble with this is like computers in a sense. You, the, the, the technology is changing so rapidly and it's improving so rapidly, you don't know when to go, come in. And you feel like you'll get stuck with a version 1.0. Because it's, you know, it's, so, yeah, it's so much more expensive than a computer. I mean, a computer, okay, so it's a thousand Sure. More comp expensive than a computer. Yes. Well, did you hear? Yeah. Well, the thing is, that there's when you look at uh, how it is right now. You know, in 2011, it was a great deal because I leased. So you're not you're not buying a computer. You can't lease, and you get caught in that. A car, you can, and so. When those three, those three years, at the end of 2000, uh, at the end of my lease of the first vehicle, I was reluctant to give that car away because I loved it. It's a great... Three years. Yes, it was there. It was $400 a month. Uh, I got $5,000 to start that to pay. Um, nowadays, you're going to pay... There's a huge variety, and you saw all those different cars. You have... If you can afford luxury, there's that. It's probably the nicest car ever produced. Vers no, no, no. $5,000 rebate may give you. No, it's, it's mind-boggling because it's a, such a good deal. So, but the $400 a month, that was... So now it's, uh, you, you pay $200 a month. But remember, there are no oil changes. There's no gas. So the cost per, per year, driving is extremely low so you're saving a lot of money as you go um, the, the so the economics now work you may you may it, it, so you lease I leased just this year the beginning of the year um, with knowing that in 2000 well yeah knowing that when my lease was up I was gonna get a better car at a better deal but it's already good for me now to drive it for a number of reasons what kind of vehicle is this? A Leaf, a Nissan Leaf. But the Fiat 500 is a great deal. A lot of these cars. Two questions. One, the, the leasing option meant that you had to get a new car after three years. So have you figured in the carbon footprint of the production of the car? Uh -huh. The question is, the lease, you get a, uh, you, you have to buy another car after three years. And have you uh, factored in the amount of uh, emissions that went into producing that car. So, <clears throat> yeah, there was a study recently done with the uh, um, Union of Concerned Scientists about that question. Uh, I saw it on, on Grist a few weeks ago. And they're talking about um, if you have a, a not so uh, a economical car um, and if it's, um, if you have a Prius, it's border, and, and actually when they were looking at it and they studied it, it, it didn't take a very, it, it, they were saying pass on these economical cars. To so buy an, an economical car used or an, a new electrical vehicle, they said it's better to buy a new electrical vehicle. Um, and the thing is, I appreciate 
that that sort of rationale, and I think that's important to think about, and that's a completely valid. Um, what I see is some people they don't they don't have that. Uh, maybe they don't have the credit to get the financing for some. When you trade in that leased car, t my 2000, my white 2011 Nissan Leaf is a good car for someone at a much lower price now. And so you're, you're putting that, you're substituting uh, a really good, efficient car for one that is less likely to be so, even a Prius. And then my second question is, here in Davis, a lot of people live in apartment complexes or whatever, so the generation of recharging the vehicle. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. yeah. So the um, problem with uh, um, the question, second question is, uh, how do you deal with, uh, in cases where you're living in an apartment or group housing, you don't have control over your own power, so you rely on, um, do you have to rely on, on, on the community grid? And that is a problem. And fortunately in Davis, uh, we have a progressive set of representatives, for the most part, representing us. And um, so, <clears throat> you know, it's not going it, to, for us, we, it's very nice to have a second vehicle. Um, and uh, and nice to be able to plug in at home. So it's it's not at that point. You may find reasons not to do it. But I, I, when I see the the number of people who are driving internal combustion engines, I think, gosh, you know, there's there's they don't have as good a reason <laughs> to drive. What is the driving range? The driving range. Uh, what is the driving range? The driving range of of electric cars now vary a lot. Um, and they're getting better with each new generation. My car runs about 90. My first car ran about 75. Um, but you can today buy cars, expensive cars, that uh, ride, uh, that, are, that go for 250 miles. Um, they're still, uh, it's still time consuming to charge on the go uh, if you're going farther than that. So, um, yeah. The question is, if I hadn't put in the um, solar panels, what was the increase in your electrical bill? It was. It depends, of course, on your amount of driving that you're doing. I was spending about $125, $130 a month uh, on gas, and uh, it went to about $25 increase in electricity. So it's... I'm sorry? Uh, no, the panels knocked it off. $25 more a month to charge Yes. Yeah. Do you have a place to charge your car at work? Yeah. Is that in Sacramento? Yes. Yeah. I, the question was, do you have a place at work to charge your car? Um, and that's, that varies a lot since I work for the state. It, but for a while, I wasn't able to. And uh, so now I have a... Uh, we moved, and so we're looking to put in solar panels now. We just have a regular plug that we plug the car into. I plug in at work, but if I, if I couldn't, um, I, it would still be enough for me to get there. I would just do it a little differently. And so I was looking at the leaf and somebody who's having it, I was talking to him, and he said, you know, um, so I said, so would, would you take this to San Francisco? In fact, I said, no, I wouldn't worry about it. So maybe Roseville, maybe Roseville. Um, I wonder how it fits into the you know, portfolio of vehicles. Is that at home, you have how many people in your household, how many cars do you have that run internal combustion? Yes. Yeah. So, right. Yeah. So we we the the question was, can you get to Sacramento, or San Francisco? And and a friend said, no, you probably can. And he's right. It's it's a bit too far for that for the technology now. And the portfolio of my sort of transportation access uh, personally is we have a van. Um, our we have three children and two of us. So and we all fit in the Leaf. So. Um, most of our driving is for me commuting, but also we drive around town sometimes, you know, at na night there's situations, the weather or whatever. So um, we use about, it's, it's basically a hybrid, we have a collective hybrid vehicle. You know, we, we use uh, the electric vehicle for everything we, then it can do. 
And for everything else, we use the van. It's about 15, 20 percent, maybe, of our driving. It, you really can't, uh, unless you are exclusively going to stay really within the island here today. Well, the. Right. Mm -hmm. A lot of us, a lot of us do have uh, multiple cars. We live with someone else who also has a car, um, and so those and those tasks are divided in a in an anticipate. You can anticipate in what kind of vehicle would be optimal for that sort of trip. So. Um, you know, the, the last person I talked to with who was, we talked briefly about having an electric vehicle. The one problem that he has with the electrical vehicle is that he and his wife fight over who's going to use it. Oh, we don't have bike sharing either. I mean, Zipcar has an electric fit that you can request that. Uh huh. Which is a good idea, right? For a lot of reasons. Uh -huh. I did a much bigger, just turn it over to a fraction. Uh, you know, the uh, freeze. Uh, the energy involved uh, makes the lithium uh, battery very significant. That reduces white matter from the fibrin. It's still really important. But uh, yeah, that's that's really active. Uh, I, I'm not sure. Uh, I, it, oh, the the question was. The, 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 the advertising of the life of the vehicle is my business analysis of basically the Yeah. So uh, the the concern was, and then the question is, is he's heard that the, the there's no question that the, the electric vehicle is much more efficient than the internal combustion engine, but producing those lithium ion batteries is a big input of energy. And uh, he saw a study that amortized over the life cycle of the car that it adds a significant amount. And I, I, I haven't seen that study. I know that, you know, if you've heard about Merchants of Doubt, this new documentary that's out, there's a lot of uh, misinformation, and I'm not saying that's a misinformation. I think you should, you know, take it for what it is uh, and choose the best of what's available. <clears throat> uh huh. Yeah. Yeah. No. It. Yeah. And that's why biking is great. It's for you know better, but. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So the question was, um, well, they, they, they've, when this church was built, they, they put in a couple uh, electric um, charging stations. And, um, but going forward, sort of assessing what's needed and how, um, a question, how I feel about what my needs are, other vehicles get a sense of the community's needs. Um, for, for most, you know, I, I, I opportunistically charge when there's avail. In fact, I plugged in over here. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and uh, for uh, it's great to have them. And it, I found it's it's very good for the, uh, businesses to have it in front of them because it draws those customers. Like Ace has one across the street. I I find myself at Ace more than I would, or walking to the businesses from there. And it's good exercise and so on. Um, though though that's just opportunistic. The fact that you can plug in it at your house, if you own a house, it's not really that much of a concern, especially if you, if you already plug in at work. Um, that's the nice thing about comparing versus hydrogen. There's a, there's a big loss of uh, energy when you're, when you're trying to you know, break up water molecules and then store it and then put pressurize it and so on for the hydrogen vehicles, whereas electric, you, you can just go right there. It's... it's, it's and, and, and the other thing about the hydrogen is 
the you need that infrastructure. We already have the infrastructure, all those electrical things. We, we live with electrical devices all around us, and this is just another one. So in terms of having your own house, I, it's okay. Um, in terms of as a society that promotes this long term, it's just a drop in the bucket. It's a tiny, tiny amount that really needs to be done. We need to be thinking much bigger than what's presently done. So we need, in Davis, 100, I think, would be you know, a good start. So when you plug in, say, it goes to like a, uh, a No, it's, it, it's no cost. It's, it's through the city, but not all uh, chargers are no cost. Some do have a, a fee. There's a charge, there's a network that you can put a credit on. And it's pretty smart, actually. At Target, they have a few uh, plugins where you have uh, the, the first three hours, I think, or the first two hours are free, and then after that, you pay a certain rate, which I think is fair. Uh, so you're not using it just. And how long does it take to charge your car? Yeah, it, for my, the new, newer generation of Leaf, it takes about six hours, and I think that's fairly typical. Uh, generally, your car is in your driveway for, oh, it, at 120, it takes from empty maybe 12 hours or 14 hours, but your car is in your driveway in your home, sleeping and so on. It, yeah, it charges. Um, so there are charging stations at, at the Amtrak station. Yes. So if you charge there, where, which is a permit parking area, can you park your car there to be charged for like six hours, or is there a limit? I'm not. I, uh, the question is: There's a, a charging station at the Amtrak station, and uh, can you s be there for six hours charging? Um, I'm not sure what the policy is there. Generally, for electric vehicle spaces, um, those are reserved for cars that are charging. So once the car is finished charging, it should move out of that spot. And the, the common um, sort of courtesy is to allow others to take the plug and uh, move it to their vehicle. Um, or, you know, you can go ahead and take that if it's done charging. Um, so, um, I'm not sure they, if you should, as far as, um, you should pull that car out, if, but I'm not sure how they work it. But yeah, in four hours generally will be plenty because you're not going to run it down to zero to park there. You, you see, you see gigs in terms of the charge. How, how, how much do they charge to charge? Do they give you first two hours free or anything like that? You see Davis? No. I think you have to be an employee. Uh, you know, It's for free, but then you have to have a parking permit. Right. Because the cost of parking parking. Yeah, you need a permit, just whatever permit. To Fairly ad hoc, the network. I mean, everyone has their own policy. Whoever, every business. Yeah. The business itself buys the charger and then decides on how it wants to make it. Well, a lot of cases, it's the city, the, the community, or it could be, you know, the business. Yeah, yeah, you don't, if you have your own house, you can just charge at home. There's no big deal. It's just, yeah, if you don't have access, then it becomes an issue. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I have two questions. Um, I'm allergic to new cars, and okay. so I have to always buy used. Uh -huh. Do they lease used EVs? Uh, do, the question is, do they lease used EVs? Uh, there's a, yeah. Yeah, new cars have a uh, really strong odor um, that people are sensitive, some people are sensitive to. <clears throat> yeah, if you've been in a new car recently, you'll notice. <clears throat> um, they must, you must be able to get a good deal, I would think, on a used electric vehicle. Because the Nissan, at this point, they've already gone through their first three, four years. They have a lot of used vehicles on stock, in stock, so. And then my second question is, um, and I wanted to have an up the capacity of the house from 100 amps to 200. But he's going to charge $1,000, which I think you know, I have to know about. And then he said, don't do it until you know what kind of car you got and what kind of plug it is. Is that, is that really necessary? Right. So the question is, um, she, the panel may not take the load of an electric car. She's thinking about updating the panel from 100 to 200 watts. And um, does it matter what kind of car? Because the electrician said, wait. 
the um, the there are two. Uh, there's one, um, the J1772 plug is the standard plug around here, and that's the 240 volt. Um, there is a program now called the Property Assessed Clean Energy, um, which is probably something that I should have mentioned here. It allows for um, financing. It's more for solar panels, uh, efficient uh, water conservation that the County of Yolo has recently instituted a year ago or so. And you can get your auto... If you own your own home, you have a pre-approved rate that's quite high to make these changes that you need. And the payments are put on with your uh, tax bill and amortized over 20 years. So a lot of times, for instance, for solar, you may save $60 a month uh, from your electricity and amortizing over 20 years, the cost of those panels may cost $20, $30 a month. So it's a, you're saving money every month. Um, and they apply to a variety of circumstances like upgrading your electrical panel for electric vehicles. So, um, so those sorts of things are, are worth looking into. But um, as far as there, there are, there is another um, at the higher level, uh, 480 volt, which is uh, um, there are at least, there are three um, different um, plugs. There's the Tesla plug that they have free charging in these, this network that's, um, nationwide and Folsom and, um, and uh, in the Bay Area. But there, there's also uh, what the Nissan LEAF uses, the CADMO, uh, CADMO that's, um, that's most used. And then there's a new system that hasn't been really widely adopted yet that's, uh, that the um, American companies might use. But for now, at that, two, two, one, uh, that 240 level, the J20, uh, J7, the J1772 plug is the one to go and the one you'll find. And all cars have that one, even the Tesla. It's very interesting, but I think you should... Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Okay. I don't need that. Yeah. Okay. Well, we... So we also wanted to talk about bicycling and um, living... Living Carf, Living Carf, yeah, this, it's not, the mic doesn't uh, project and amplify, it's just for the recording. So, um, I just wanted to point out my wife, uh, Nancy's here. Um, so the issue of Living Car Free um, is really, there's two questions there, really. Why and how? And... Uh, Maybe with this group, the why of it is, is not as important. Um, for us, the reason we got rid of our car, and, and we were just realizing it's been 12 years this month that we did that. Um, oh. I really, no, I, I don't think that's <laughs> the response that's <laughs> appropriate. I mean, keep in mind, if you were here this morning, um, Emily Abdulghani, you know, when she talked about privilege, you know, we're privileged to be able to make this decision, right? We're privileged in the sense that we live in a town that had the foresight to develop the infrastructure that allows biking to happen. We have to acknowledge that. I mean, and we live in a place, obviously, we're privileged in a place with weather like this in March. <laughs> so we're privileged in that way. And we're also privileged because economically we could arrange our lives and our kids' lives at the time uh, to figure out how to, to do it. Uh, but it was part of a, for us, it was part of an overall set of decisions we were making at the time. Our kids were in elementary school and junior high. And it was, it was a, a, an overall set of decisions about um, how we were going to live more lightly on the earth. We, we saw at that time that uh, our nation was going to war to support a lifestyle that we participated in and that uh, we felt it was important for us to reconsider that lifestyle. Um, now, you could debate whether that was really the cause of the war, but we certainly believed that. And we've lived all over the world, and we've seen how violence is used to help certain people maintain a way of being and living. And, and we felt like, as privileged individuals, that we needed to counter that. So it was part of a larger set of decisions we were making at the time to change the way we live. And it's been revolutionary for us. The, the how of it, which is why we brought some bikes, is, is the other thing. But before I get to the bikes, because everybody here knows bikes, the first how 
and Nancy and I were talking about it last night, the first how is really a decision of how are you going to live <laughs> without a car? And it's come up in the discussion you just had over electric cars. When we made the decision to go without a car, the first decision was how close are we going to live to home? So evenings out in Sacramento, it was done. Popping down to the Bay Area for a Saturday and back was, was pretty much done. Um, figuring out how to get around when it was raining became a really big issue. And uh, especially how to get our kids back and forth to activities, especially at night, became, those were the how questions we really need to wrestle with, we needed to wrestle with. And, and quite frankly, I think, I think we're really in agreement over this, is that every decision that we made t in order to get to just living with bikes turned out to be a really great thing. Um, it felt like, you know, it can feel like you're giving up a lot. I mean, mobility is so built into our understanding of what it is to, to be an American. You know, the freedom of the road is even romanticized in every car commercial you look at. In fact, you can ride a bike up onto the ridge up there, just uh, on, on the Marin, just north of the Marin headlands where they do those car commercials. Trust me, it's a lot better on a bike. But there's that freedom motif. And, and, and so inherently when you stop buying into that motif, you think, oh my goodness, you know, that's going to be so constraining. And actually, it's been absolutely liberating because um, being closer to home is relaxing. <laughs> not fighting traffic and not worrying about where you're going to park and, and, and not having a lifestyle that's so overcharged and overwrought and overprogrammed, which a car enables. Uh, and you know this if you've had kids. Our cars enable a lot of bad behavior. And I mean bad behavior in the sense of not evil. I mean bad in the terms it's not good for us. So once we got kind of past the fact that those changes were going to come, then we could talk about the how in terms of how to really make it happen. But I want to insist that um, doing it has been really good. We still go out of towns. We take the train. We take vacations by train and bus and public transit. Um, our daughter's pregnant now, so we are in a zip car so that if she needs us, because she doesn't actually own a car either, and even though she's 27, with two kids and a third on the way, uh, and my son is 23, 24, my, 24 and 28, man, I'm losing track of my kids. Um, he doesn't have a car either, and actually this is my daughter's bike, and I just want to, I'm not trying to sell a particular brand of bike, but the main how issue for us is, and for everyone, is how do you, how do you just live, right? Because if nothing else, you still need to shop. I mean, you still need to go shopping. And, and there, are there are lots of options. You know, it used to be when we started this kind of journey, it, the best option was towing a cart behind you. Um, and there are carts of all time. I have a cart that I still have. I don't use it very much, and I'd be happy to loan it to you. That'll take 300 pounds. I've moved refrigerators on it. We moved our whole house from North Davis about two miles across to another North Davis. All our friends came together, brought all their carts of all shapes and sizes, and we, and we did it. And we did it. It was fun. Uh, by bike, sorry. Not car, bike. And we did it. And it was fun. But it took a variety of machines like this. And I just want to say that the evolution from the time that we got rid of our car till now, the technology is, is in bikes is, is awesome because... My daughter is not an athletic person. Uh, she's not particularly strong. She doesn't, her balance is good. She was a dancer, but she's not a great cyclist. You know what I mean? She's not a vehicular cyclist, someone that feels comfortable being out in traffic. But she's taking two kids and groceries on this bike. And I just want to show you that, you know, when her baby was small, when her child was small, the child sat up here. Uh, and now... Zochi is her name. She's graduated. She's two years old. Now she sits back here. And these bars, which you can add to this bike, um, make it safe for kids. So she can tow her two kids in the back here, sitting here. And at the same time, these bags, which are resting on rails down here, can take, m trust me, more than, a week, more than a week's groceries. More than a week's groceries. You can put about, all told, you can probably put about 180 pounds on a bike like this. 
uh, and not including the, dr the rider. But um, it's a very smooth ride. It's a very stable ride. Even for someone who is not, again, a very accomplished cyclist, uh, she feels very comfortable on this bike. Um, I'm not trying to sell this bike. All I'm saying is the technology of biking has changed the point where you can have an all-in-one bike, very stable, on which you can take a lot of weight to live your life. You had a question or a comment? Yeah, so the question is whether we've looked into electric assist. Now, we have a friend, a good friend, who also has children, and she is now commuting to Sacramento several days a week, and she got an electric assist, which you can get on a bike like this. An electric assist is not the same as just an electric motor. An electric assist is you pedal, and it gives you more force. So it's like a force multiplier. That sounds like a military term. A force multiplier, or a power multiplier, and they're becoming very popular. They're battery, so battery charge, the same. And they are outstanding for people uh, who have any mobility problems. We're not quite at the age yet. You know, we're, we're in our 50s. But I expect that someday, you know, we're going, to be, uh, we're going to be needing electric assist. Nance, could you wheel your bike over? So how do you do it? This is simple, right? But how do you do it is you get a really, really good light. All right? You get a really good light. And you pay a little bit more for a really good light. Right? And this is a light that plugs into, you know, a USB port on a computer to recharge. So you never put batteries in this light. It, it's a rechargeable battery, just like a car. And you get a good flashing for the back. If you take care of your lighting, you can go just about any time of the day or night, pretty safely. My wife's bike has an integrated light in the front, which is built into the hub at the bottom. So when she pedals, the light automatically goes on, and it's on all the time, even in the day. Um, she has a bell. Uh, bells are uh, just a, a nice added thing. The other thing is, um, Nancy's bike, uh, if you just want to take one of your bags off, this is just a bike that anyone can get. This is a cheap, you know, it's an inexpensive bike. This is a good bike for as you get older, because even if you're a, uh, a man, uh, this bike doesn't require you to uh, lift your leg up over it all. And trust me, when you get to my age, you start saying, do I really have to lift that leg one more time over that bike? This is a step through. Or if you're wearing a skirt, which I don't typically, but you do. Um, I mean, I've, I have, but, um, but, but this is just a regular bike. But if you get two bags like this, which fold up, for us as, you know, two empty nesters now, we're, you know, we can get most of our groceries in two of these bags, which go on the back of Nance's bike, and she can take it home. Um, the only other thing I'll say is, the cool thing about having a bike is, um, over the course of, uh, and I haven't sat down and done the calculations, but over the course of 12 years, we've saved, saved a tremendous amount of money. <laughs> Just think of your car insurance. <laughs> so that means that I don't mind investing a little bit more in really good rain gear. Rain gear that breathes. Rain gear that doesn't make me feel all clammy by the time I arrive. So you get a, a good rain jacket, and you get a good pair of rain pants, and you can arrive at, at your destination completely dry. Now, footwear is a bit of a challenge, but um, it can be overcome with things over your feet. I was at a recent meeting at UC Davis. It was pouring rain. It was a fairly formal conference setting. And uh, I came on my bike, and I had my rain gear on. And I arrived in the building, peeled off my rain gear, and I was completely dry. I went up to the conference room, and everybody else arriving with their car and umbrellas was soaking wet. And um, it was a kind of a joke, but a kind of a good joke, meaning that it's possible to arrive dry and secure even though you're coming on a bike in the pouring rain. And I'll just add one more thing, if you haven't thought about it. A real key, and it might be hard to see, but stand up, is the fenders on a bike. Fenders are the greatest invention because a lot of the wetness of riding a bike comes from the spray from the tires. A cheap pair of fenders for the front and the rear will keep you dry. I think that's all I want to say. I, uh, I'm sure there's some questions, but I'll answer them. We'll go here first and then see if I can. Uh, so the question is, uh, what do you do if you're wearing glasses for visibility in the rain? I use my fingers as windshield wipers. 
And that's one of the reasons I've gone to contact lenses, um, even though I need reading glasses, is because uh, it's so much easier. And I, I, I cycle a lot more than Nance does. She commutes every day about three miles, two miles to work. Well, it was more. We've moved downtown now, so it's closer. And I do everything on a bike, including tour and do my vacation. So I ride a lot more than Nance, but um, that's one of the reasons I went to contact. Yeah, yeah. Well, anything that's Gore-Tex will be great. Uh, shoe covers are great. You can even put plastic bags over if you need to. A cover on the bike during? You mean when it's parked? No. No, we're pretty happy with the bike parking uh, in Davis. Um, we, we will be having more secure bike parking at the train station. Am uh, California Amtrak is, is putting in some secure uh, credit card parking like they have more in the Bay Area. That's be going to become, it's going to be coming to the train station. U UC Davis will also, I think, add more. But we're pretty happy with the bike parking. And we just keep our chains oiled. We just do the basic maintenance to keep our chains oiled and to, and to you know, wash them off or wipe them off before we get in the house. We live in an, a small apartment in the central core right now, and our biggest challenge is that we don't have secure bike parking. So when we first moved to the place and we're parking them in a slot underneath the apartment building, the bikes weren't being stolen because we have really good locks, and I should have mentioned that. You need really good locks in Davis. They will get stolen if you have a cable lock, but, um, but we were having parts stolen off our bikes. We've had derailers stolen. We've had lights stolen. We've had racks stolen. I've had pedals stolen, and, and people will steal just about anything off a bike if it's there in an unsecured spot. So we've had to sort of shift our, uh, our we've moved our bikes up into our apartment and put them on a patio. It means we don't have the use of the patio, but it does mean we have secure bike parking. Right. Well, it does, although a bike like that in the, you know, we call the light, they're calling, they're called lightning bolt, the, the angled, which they have like out here in the uh, parking lot, the angled uh, uh, lightning bolt racks, uh, they're fine for a bike like that. They're, they're fine. There's no, I, in fact, I had it parked out there. It's fine. This bike also, as you see, has a, has a very nice kickstand, which is critical. It's a dual kickstand on both sides like a motorcycle. I think we're almost out of time, but we'll take a couple more questions if there are any. Uh, you know, I, I actually helped. Uh, well, there was a, there was a there was a question about our secure biking. Um, all the new, all new, all new commercial and industrial, and even um, in part apartment buildings, new construction in the city or significant reconstruction is going to require. Uh, putting in of secure bike parking. Now we haven't seen a lot of that yet because we haven't had a lot of new construction, but we're certainly seeing, we will be seeing a move towards that. And that secure usually means inside or covered and with a lock. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I mean, it, 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 you can, the, so the question is what about parking tricycles and, and have a bigger, uh, you know, obviously they're wider in the back. I could tell you we haven't begun to really talk about bike parking for those types of things. We haven't. I'll give you another example. We don't have it here. We used to have a back feats, which you've seen around town, which is a, a, a bike with a, a, a big wooden box in the center. And you often see them with kids around. Those are Dutch made bikes. They're excellent, really I used to tote Nan Nance around in it when we had one. Um, they're great date bikes. Um, but um, they, they're very difficult to, to, to park um, in, in our current bike infrastructure, in our parking infrastructure. And I'll be honest with you, we ha haven't really come to grips yet with what it's going to take to provide. Best I can tell you to do is park on the end. And, and, in, and the two locking systems that I really recommend is, you know, my daughter has a... Uh, and it's in the bag. A U-lock, if you if you can get close enough, it's in that side. A U-lock is a is a really I mean this is a must-have. You don't use a cable anymore. Do not use a cable. And then the the as equally as good are these. Um, and you can't see it, but this is a this is a braided chain. It's not quite braided, but these are a heavy-duty, almost impossible to cut through chain. 
And this gives you more flexibility if you have a tricycle because you can get these at various lengths that'll go much longer than a U-lock and these are very hard to, you, you essentially can't cut through them without, uh, without real. Now having said that, you know, we, we've had bikes stolen. We were shocked at, at the lengths gone to, but, um, but these work and these will deter most, step, uh, most steps and they give you more flexibility. No, there's no, as far as I know, there, there isn't. Uh, the problem is you need to really, lock, I mean, if, if she's willing to park in a, in a car spot, so the question is, what about parking a, a bike, a tricycle in a car spot? The point is, you want to lock it to something, right? They're pretty heavy, and I wouldn't worry too much about someone stealing your bike for a short-term trip into the thing, but you could even lock it to itself in a case like that, because you're not going to pick it up and walk away with it. I've been... People have stolen try people will steal just about anything. Yeah, Sam. Uh, yeah. yeah, so the question is the the parts the parts Yeah. S so Right, so cable, but, but there are known incidences, especially on UC Davis campus, of, peop of thieves with small bolt cutters in their pocket coming up and snipping cables and walking away with bikes. That's known. Um, I'm going to answer it. Give me a second. The thefts that we've had of parts have all been overnight. All right, so I think thefts are a two-part, two-nature, one is cable locks anywhere, anytime. Uh, two is parts or harder theft jobs overnight in an unlighted area. Now, some of the crime rings we know are pretty sophisticated. So I mentioned the back feats. Our daughter had a back feats, again, that Dutch bike, locked with a chain lock to a post in an apartment complex, and it was stolen. Now, we were, of course, devastated at the loss. That'd be like you losing your car. The only problem is you could get your car back. We'll never get the back feats back. But they had to have, they had, to have had serious material to be able to, to cut through all of the thing. And it was an overnight, and it, it was a sophisticated job. It was like a sophisticated car theft. Um, daylight parking, yeah, it's overnight. Yeah. So we'll... We're, we're all, I think we're out of time, but we'll take a few more questions if you want to stay. I mean, no hurry. Right. So the question is, what's the current status of bike path repaving? The current status of bike path repaving is the same current status as the repaving of our roads, uh, which is to say very far behind. Uh, up until a few years ago, up until two years ago, we were putting under a million dollars a year into uh, road repair. And part of that is because of a shift, the shifting nature of federal and state funds for highway. And we're, we're all aware of that. We've all been reading the stories about how uh, 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 um, gas tax has, has not for a long time now paid for upkeep on, the on streets that we have. So we're behind. And the priorities um, are the bike paths that are currently uh, asphalt and have root incursion. Um, we're, I'm, I, the, the path along Russell, which is one of the worst, um, I'm kind of waiting to see the development happening on West Village University and what they're going to put in on the university side. And I don't have the transportation plan in front of me yet, but that is a priority area. But funding is the issue. And so what we are working on as a council right now is um, deciding on how we're going to start building a, a fund to, to maintain our roads. And we put our, in, in Davis, we put our bike paths and roads in the same um, uh, replacement category. So we don't do roads first and then bike paths. We take priorities in both and start working on them. But I don't have a timeline for you on that path yet. Uh, and, and there is coming to the B Bike and Transportation Committee this week an item on the transportation improvement plan, which would be 
the short-term priorities for road and bike path improvements. So you can be looking for that. It'll be coming to council very soon. Yeah. Uh, I think there was a question over here, Rodney, and then we'll go back there. Or do comment, maybe. Yeah. 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 No, there's no, Rodney's raising the issue, there is no foolproof lock. That is correct. That is correct. Uh, you can use Freon to freeze it, hit it with a hammer, it'll break. I think the key with bicycling, bicycle locks is you want to reduce the opportunistic threats first. Because there are opportunistic thieves that will look for the low-hanging fruit and take it. Jobs like this, a back feat, so, you know, something more sophisticated to get rid of a U-lock, those are costly and they take time, the overnight issue. And so if you're parking overnight, you're going to want to think differently about security than if you're just leaving in front of the downtown, you know, eatery for a couple of hours. Where there's well, and there's also that. I mean, thieves are sophisticated in knowing what their market is. And so if I can snatch a cheap bike, I'll snatch it. If I really want a high-end bike, I'm going to probably figure out a way to get it. Just as high-end cars are also, and certain types of cars that they know they can turn over quickly, are the target of thieves. There is no foolproof way. I'm not claiming that. I'm just telling you what can be done to reduce the probability. We'll go to one more question. I think we're done. Or comment. Uh, these bikes? Um, so I, I can't tell you how much they weigh. And, and I don't, you know, I worry about, I don't worry about bike weight because on a flat terrain like Davis, get it moving. Yeah, oh, well. Yeah, yeah. Um, the bottom line is if you want to do cargo on a bike, you're not going to do it with a high-end road bike that's light. You're, you're going to need something that's aluminum or steel, and by the very nature of it being hauled, you're going to have your wheels are going to be heavier because they have to, you don't want them to wa waffle, and you need heavier duty wheels so that you don't get spikes, spokes breaking. The point is these are not light bikes, and they're not built for light, um, but they're built for cargo. The cost of this entire outfit here, I mean everything, everything, $1,600. The bigger one. So that's bags and monkey bars and this extra seat that did, which did not come with it. I'm saying $1,600 to $2,000 to outfit a bike like this. Uh, my wife's bike there with the integrated light and it's a step through and a pretty high quality. It's about a $650, total $700. Yeah to put a bike like that together. Now, you buy, a, you buy a bike like this, a bike like that, that bike should last you really for the rest of your life. I mean, I end up getting new bikes periodically, but that is more of a consumer taste thing than it is a real necessity. You can ask my wife about that. Um, steel bikes will last you forever. Steel, I, I have, <laughs> no, I don't have that many. I, I have a road bike and I have a touring bike. I have almost all steel bikes. And steel bikes are great because steel bikes just last forever. So anyway, thank, I'm sorry. This is a Yuba Mundo. Uh, and I don't know where it's made. Uh, Marin is, a, is the one that my wife has. And I have a Trek touring bike, which is designed to carry weight uh, on multiple day trips which I've taken into the Sierra or along the West Coast, and you can usually put about 100 pounds on a bike like that in various bag configurations. Anyway, thanks for your interest, and if you want to talk more about bike-free or car-free lifestyle, let us know. And come and look at the bikes. <laughs>